here and welcome back to Don't Open That Door. Come along with our triumvirate of terror as we descend into darkness, hurtle into horror, and plunge into peril. If you've ever thought a MILF was too good to be true, you're in the right place. I'm Justin, and I'm that guy who spied on the revolution so it never happened. I'm Nico, and my favorite Lady Gaga album is Art Pop. Well, I'm Dan, your friendly sales associate at your local camera store. <laughs> And we are here today to review Baba Yaga. And we ain't talking about John Wick. This is the 1973 movie. This was directed by Corrado Farina, starring Isabel de Funes as Valentina, George Eastman as Arno, Carol Baker as Baba Yaga, Ellie Galliani as Annette, and Angela Cavello as Tony. So we open with fashion photographer and just general photographer extraordinaire Valentina at a party with artists and intellectuals. She decides this shit is lame until she's going to leave now. And she gets a ride with her friend and a man named Arno. And she kind of says, all right, guys, I'm going to walk home from here. So while walking home after they take her, you know, pretty close to her house, she sees a cute dog in the middle of the road. And all of a sudden, bam, there's a car bearing down on it. So she like intercedes like Yusuke did in Yu Yu Hakusho. Well, it turns out the driver of that same car was Baba Yaga, a mysterious woman who offers Valentina a ride the rest of the way home and says they were fated to meet. And Valentina says, yeah, sure. So that happens. That night, she has a Nazi dream sequence, which is not the only time that'll happen to her in this movie. But Dan, what happens next? Well, the next day, Valentina is doing a photo shoot for a fashion magazine. As soon as the shoot is over, Bobby Yaga shows up and does some kind of magic to Valentina's camera, bewitching her in the process. Also, Bobby Yaga is thirsting real hard for Valentina. As she leaves, Baba Yaga gives Valentina her addy and tells her, hey, yo, slide through sometime. Fair enough. And I'm back at it once again, because right after that, Arno calls her and he's like, yo, come take some pictures for me real quick. Unfortunately, her now haunted ass camera actually breaks Arno's camera when she takes a picture of it. But no one kind of has figured that out yet. They just think the camera's broken. That evening, Arno and Valentina head back to her place, look through some good old-fashioned Italian hentai, and then they bone. Tony, one of Valentina's friends, comes over for a photo shoot the next morning, so they, you know, start setting up the shots. However, once Valentina takes her picture with, again, haunted-ass camera, Tony collapses like she was shot. Arno and Valentina call her a cab while follow me on this one. She's having a smoke, and he's taking a drag. For more on that... Well, you gotta listen to a couple songs. But then Valentina says fuck it and heads to Casa Baba Yaga. Just, just one song, actually. Well, <laughs> you, you never know. You, you never know. But Dan, what happens in La Casa? Or how do you say uh, house one... in Italian? I think it's still Casa. Hold on. Well, more on that later. Dan, hit me with it. Once Valentina arrives at La Casa, is it La? Doesn't matter. And she asks Baba Yaga <laughs> yeah, if she is. can take some more photos at her house. She says that's fine, but she also gives Valentina a doll in fetish wear, whose name is Annette, and it's supposed to keep her safe from all sorts of evils, apparently. Valentina also finds a random hole that seemingly has no bottom, because that's something commonly found in houses. But more on that later as well. Now later, Valentina... Now later? Now and later... Yo, later. remember now and laters? Motherfuckers yeah. used to go crazy over them shits in high school. Yo, it was yep. the illicit trade, bro. Some gum for some now and laters, bro. For real. Yeah. Later, Valentina goes out to photograph a protest outside of a church. Look as at soon this as she snaps photograph. a picture. I'm sorry. As soon as she snaps the photograph, point. one of the protesters oh. falls down, <laughs> dead. At this point, Valentina starts to put things together and suspects that Bobby Yaga slash the creepy doll slash her camera are causing mischief. She then has another weirdo Nazi dream. Well, I suppose we got to give Nico something to say. So Nico, what happens next? So the next day, Valentina is doing another photo shoot. And one of the models comments that the doll seems off. Because I mean, like, fucking look at it, right? During the shoot, another coincidence happens. The studio loses power and the doll somehow takes a photo Yes, during the blackout, when you can't see. And one model later turns up dead. Eesh. Valentina links up with Arno, who is filming a tour 
turbo racist commercial. More on that later. And she explains everything weird that's been happening. Arno brushes her off, but they go back to her place and develop the photos and her camera. They find out that, yep, the doll, in fact, did take some creepy photos. And both of them are thoroughly convinced that Baba Yaga and the doll are evil. And she has another weird Nazi dream. In the dream, Valentina learns that Annette has a critical weakness. Being stabbed by large needles. Does this sound fucking nuts to you? It should. Moving on, though. Well, Dan, I mean, you typically have to solve things here, and you got a lot to solve, so how's this one end? There sure is a lot to solve. Baba Yaga calls Valentina to come get her camera, so Valentina obliges, naturally. They have a tense confrontation, which escalates rather quickly from Valentina rebuking her advances to being on the receiving end of some kinky torture where Annette, in human form now, whips her over and over. Arno comes to the rescue, Valentina kills Annette, and shoves Baba Yaga into a comically vast hole. Right after that, the police show up, and it turns out the house was actually vacant all along. The hole just leads into a basement with Baba Yaga's stuff. The end. Well, we got a lot here to go through, so let's go ahead and get started. And I'm going to lead here talking about how the movie looks. I am fucking in love with the way that this movie was shot. Like, I think that normally really fast, you know, scene switches and even different camera angles can oftentimes be very disorienting. But me personally, I found that this movie was just really well shot. Like, I think that like the different camera switches added at times tension, at times just a little bit of confusion. But I wasn't confused, but I can tell the character might have been confused or scared. So all in all. You know, I liked that. And also it's the, you know, it's the 70s. So all the 70s fashion is there. So you could see it as well. But Dan, how does this one look to you? I, a lot of the same kind of things that you just mentioned. I enjoyed how it looked. I don't know where else to put this, but I guess it falls into how it looks. There's a lot of titties in this. In this oh, hell movie. yeah. There's, there, there, is, um, there is an impressive amount of titty in this movie. <laughs> Probably yeah. about, about 40 to 50% of the movie, there's just titties. So if you watch this, just just be ready. It's definitely NSFW. And I did not watch this one at work this time. So nice, nice, fucking nice, nice, nice. proud of you. <laughs> um, I enjoyed how it God, looked. I would get fired so fucking quick if I watched I this at work. Too. Oh, my God. Yeah, you, you watch you most sure shit would. at work, I feel like. But, Nico, you're not getting fired, but you better get fired up. How does this one look? I am also a fan of it. I like the overall sort of just like grain of just the sheen of debauchery that is going through this whole bizarre film that I'm still trying to figure out how I feel about. But it is, that aside, very fun in a way that I wasn't expecting in terms of the visuals. It, it is a very dynamic movie, I think, because of the sort of cinematography like you were talking about, Justin, where it has a lot of interesting cuts that really add to the, the film not feeling very static. True enough. So let's go ahead now. And Dan, I want to sound some ideas off of you. Oh, how does this movie sound? I love the soundtrack. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was it's fantastic. So fucking good. There was such good themes and shit throughout. Like Baba Yaga's theme music was a quick little like piano that sounded mysterious, but also like romantic a little bit. Like it was really cool. And there's just so much like the soundtrack fucking slaps, to be honest. It's um, so goddamn good. Yeah. And that was one of my favorite parts of the movie. I mean, Nico, you already kind of started, so go ahead. You also are a fan of the soundtrack. So a good half of this movie, I want to say, is just motherfuckers absolutely shredding some jazz, like hard bop shit, like almost just going absolutely fucking nuts on the saxophone. And you would think that that would be just grating, but it fits the vibe so naturally that I can't imagine there being anything else in this movie, but this 
truly bizarrely fun display of musicianship some of the shit that is going by as whoever is playing here which hats fucking off to i couldn't find any of that out but if you are listening a uh, big fan of your work <laughs> i like the soundtrack there's like some funk and then there'd be like some jazz like interspersed yeah, into so that as funk, well man and also shout out to like the little piano piece that plays at the end I'm a, I'm a fan of it personally I, I dug it i definitely dug it i definitely dug it real quick this is gonna sound really specific but if you've ever seen a 70s italian movie this is that like and i mean obviously it is a 70s italian movie but it, i feel like the, the sound and the visuals just fit that very well like stereotypical in a good way but like that's that's what you would expect i'll give my italian stamp of approval on this as someone who is not alive in the 70s. So, top of the card here, let's start with, you know, softball. Racism. So, this movie has some, you know, fairly racist parts on the, you know, on the racism scale. I just took it out and recalibrated it. It looks like we've got some racism in this movie. So, we'll go to our white experts on the scene. Dan and Nico, what'd you guys think of the racism in this movie? <laughs> Fair. There was like, I think two parts. There's one like casual racist part, I thought. And then like a very not casual part. It was professional, actually. <laughs> professional they racism. Were paid yeah. for it. True. The first part was there's a scene where there's two models. One is a black dude. One is a white woman. And I can't remember exactly oh. what was said. <laughs> but Yo, I know. I remember what she said. I think Valentino was trying to get the, the black dude to look more like feral or like yeah i don't know angsty or some shit i don't know and she was like oh just be like your ancestors who like ate people or something yeah. and i was like whoa yeah. she I said whoa that she said she oh, said like man. channel the spirit oh, of your ancestors no. who ate missionaries that's yeah. so bad and i, I was, was like, like wow oh, and now it, 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 she just kind of slid that in there and i was like wow all right jesus and then, fucking christ like the next real like scene change that we get is when Arno, like we mentioned in this synopsis, Arno is filming this commercial for like cleaning supplies or bleach or some shit. Right. And it's this dude chasing this like black dude. And then he like dumps a bunch of bleach on the dude. And then all of a sudden the dude disappears and he's like, when you have to clean tough grease or stains or something, use this bleach. And I'm like, wow. And it leaves was really... behind what looks like an ash sort of like yeah. outline of his body yeah I was like, wow that was really fucked up i mean i'll tell you this like i'll tell you this straight up this being an italian joint and this being the 70s bruh i was ready for that like yeah. i was a thousand percent ready to hear some wild shit because oh boy oh boy italy definitely i mean even knowing some modern day shit like Obviously, racism is a problem pretty much everywhere, even in places where you might think it isn't. But yeah, like, I mean, Italy's that spot where literally like, I mean, they were doing like the banana and the monkey noises at Mario Balotelli and everything else like that not too long ago. So it's like, True. and he was the same guy who they then turned around and started calling Super Mario when he scored a couple goals. So I, yeah, it's kind of like not great. And it's something that when I see nowadays, I always think about in the cultural context where it's like if i let that air quotes here ruin or spoil a movie from me i'd almost never get to enjoy anything from the time period because racism was so casual in that time period like it's almost everywhere you look so it's definitely something that we need to like see and address and just make sure that we don't do the same shit like going forward even though people still do that shit with the cleaning supplies and shit, like yeah. that's that's a trope that like you can still see to it's this day. It's still unfortunately common, yeah. And I, I feel like I don't know. There's certain times where you can attribute it, like unfortunately that was a sign of the time, like certain phrases or something. But I feel like that commercial in this one was like beyond that. See, so you say that. But at the same time, bro, we had way worse in America, like turbo worse. 
even I, up until like I'm the not 80s. I'm saying that's okay either. Like, yeah, oh, they, they no, no, can no. both be fucked up. Oh, no, no, no. But I'm saying like in casual parlance, I am not fucking surprised. Not in the slightest, not in the least. Like that was super common, like crazy common to do. Like specifically that style of commercial. Like yeah. it was super common and kind of shitty. Have seen a lot of commercials from 1970s Italian TV? No, but I've seen 1980s Americans commercials where it's the same thing. Chinese commercials where it's the same thing. Like it's the same thing all over the world. It's been replicated many, many times. I mean, all right. Yeah, like that's literally like a tip of the iceberg type scenario with how shit used to be and still is in a lot of ways. But now we're going to go ahead and turn to Baba Yaga, not the character, although sometimes the character, but the lore behind it. Why is this movie called Baba Yaga? Why is the character called Baba Yaga? I don't know. The only thing I can think of is you got this older lady and she does witchcraft. That's about as far as I get. (laughs) So I'm going to do everyone a favor here. I, as a man with a master's in literature, have a natural passive understanding of all things that were in in books. And I didn't study anything at all about Baba Yaga in my Baba Yaga, whatever in my program. I'm fucking with you. So in Slavic folklore, Baba Yaga, also spelled with a J sometimes, is a supernatural being or one of a trio of sisters of the same name who appears as a deformed and or ferocious looking woman in fairy tales baba yaga flies around in a mortar as in like in a mortar and pestle wields said pestle and dwells deep in the forest in a hut usually described as standing on chicken legs she may help or hinder those encounter or seek her out or may play a maternal role when she has associations with forest wildlife according to vladimir props folktale morphology which i know we've all read Baba Yaga commonly appears either as a donor or a villain archetype, or maybe just altogether ambiguous. And then it goes on longer, but that's not what you're here for. Yeah. So there's really not much aside from her being old. And yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to front. I kind of sort of feel like in, in some stories, she, you know, like consumes her victims, can be kids. Yeah and everything else like that. And I just kind of feel like, I don't know. She was there. Kind of like some Hansel Gretel shit almost. Yeah. And I feel like she was, well, I feel like she was there to feast on a young, vibrant soul like Valentina. Even though Val- Valentina is like an adult, she's like a young adult. So yeah, I feel like that's, that's kind of why she was there. But they could have very easily called this some other shit. Yeah. Because this really doesn't have too much to do with the story of Bobby Yaga. Now, now, if that car was instead of wheels using chicken legs, I'm done. Yeah, I'm sold. I love it. Ten out of ten. Hundred percent. Well, I will say this too, audience, dear listener, and you, Nico and Dan. I think we've gotten through the tough, you know, conversation of racism and everything else. So let's go to the easier topic now: Nazism. So this movie has holy shit. Uh... These interlude Nazi dreams, right? Now, I really sat here and really, 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 really tried to think. Because I don't want to be a fucking plebeian. Why is it that Valentina keeps having these Nazi dreams? And I think I have an answer. But I'm curious to hear what you guys have to say. I assume it was because maybe Baba Yaga was involved somehow. Maybe she had been captured by Nazis or something and Valentina is like reliving some of her memories or illusions of her memories or something through witchcraft. She's, I don't know, whatever, but that's kind of what I assumed. So my take on it comes from something that Dan, you and I were talking about yesterday during a planning for this episode, actually. I remember you had said that this movie had had a lot taken out to cut down on time from the original cut. And there was a lot more in the original cut that was political existential thought that explained more of those dream sequences. So what we were left with because of that is 
a few dream sequences that are just very strangely themed, I guess you could say. But I'm going to be honest with you, Chief. I have no fucking idea what's going on there. So I'm going to take a stab at it. So you got to keep in mind when this movie was filmed. So 1970s, not too far away from the 40s when obviously, you know, the Nazis were kind of like at the height. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, when you see a lot of media from those times either referencing the Nazis or like everything was about the Nazis, you know what I mean? Like the, the villain of everything was the Nazis and so many different movies and everything else like that. And I think in this one, it's actually a more literal thing where I think the Nazis in her dreams represent her fears about authoritarianism and her fears about the direction in which the government is going, or at least the way she feels the government is going. And I think that often, because I think there's one dream where there's a person from real life who morphs and shifts into a Nazi officer. Like he kind of takes on that uniform, but that's not the uniform he starts with. And even Baba Yaga is seen in a Nazi outfit as well. And there's a scene where like she boxes. Yeah, that's the one of the dream sequences. Both of those scenes are dream sequences. Yeah, and there's like one where there's like a Nazi in someone's corner and she boxes him down basically and wins. And that's the only interpretation I can really see from this. I don't, if anything, this movie is not in any way, shape or form an endorsement of fascism, more to the opposite side of the spectrum, I feel. Because, and perfect transition here, but... She's a Marxist, isn't she, Nico? Valentina. It sure seems that way. And something we left out of the synopsis for the sake of what little brevity we could gather, which was, we, we had to cut a lot, but there were many conversations in this movie that were entirely just like leftist discourse on ideas about like agency and governments and stuff from the seventies relating to anarchism versus like how you go about revolutions in this otherwise truly fucking, well, not otherwise, but just truly bonkers movie that has again to remind you just so much fucking titties. So many, so much, so many. Yes. So few. Hella titties. In my opinion. So few? Uh, they could have. <laughs> they, where where they, was... They should have had more, those cowards. Where was Baba Yaga? That's what I was really looking for here. No, but so... Okay, but real shit though, same? Yeah. Baba Yaga was kind of bad too, I'm not gonna lie. I couldn't tell, bro. She was out here looking like the Wicked Witch from the East in Howl's Moving Castle at times. Not in like size, but like her outfits. But... More on that on the House Moving Castle podcast. You can catch me there. But I'll say this. It was interesting to hear because one piece of dialogue that kind of stuck with me was when Arno, he's like, I'm a whore, basically, because he films these commercials that are for the corporations. And he has a viewpoint where he basically goes and is like, well, there's nothing I can do the revolution is not going to fund itself. I can't do anything. I have to play the game. You have to know how to play the game. Valentina doesn't necessarily share that mindset, but then he tells her she does the same shit anyways, because when she shoots those photos and stuff for like the fashion magazines and stuff like that, she's basically doing the same thing. And it's interesting because the pair actually go to see uh, a German expressionist film. And I was like, Oh, are they about to watch the castle of Dr. Calamari, I know it's Caligari, but basically I was like, yo, like, it's funny. First off, that movie looked a lot like uh, Dr. Calamari, just yeah. in how it was like set up, which makes sense mm -hmm. because they're both expressionist movies. The circle is now complete, but I don't know. I, it's, there's a lot you could dive into this movie in terms of politics and political themes. And, you know, Dan, just to get your input on this here, what do you think about all the political stuff going on in this movie? I mean, for me, I didn't really fully understand it. And I think I would have gotten it more if I was alive in that time. And it was more 
apparent mm. and more relevant to me. But also, as Nico had mentioned, the movie was originally, I think, like eight or nine minutes longer. Oh, Jesus and, Christ. I thought you were going to say eight or nine hours. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and it's all political discourse. Um, but titties. some of the, from what I've read, some of the, the scenes that were cut were more political as well. That helped to make a more cohesive, I don't want to say political statement, but like plot line out of the political parts of it. So I think maybe missing that, it it kind of falls apart a little bit or it doesn't give us the full picture, I should say. So I don't really know. I do agree with you, Justin, that that conversation stuck out to me as well. And I actually really enjoyed that conversation. And I think as a creative and artist, like it, that's the kind of conversation that I think I've had numerous times with people. So it was kind of interesting to see in a movie. So, yeah. Yeah. Big ting. And now, and I did this as a total rib on you guys. I ain't going to lie. We've covered some pretty heavy topics here. So let's cover the heaviest to fall. What genre is this? <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> kind of, can we, man, we, uh, we've, listen, we've, we've run the gambit here, okay? We've covered racism. I thought we'd racism. escape this question because it usually comes so early. I was so elated, like, oh, we somehow don't have to talk about this. Great. We'll get to the what would you do, and it's fine. I don't have to say anything smart about this movie. It'll be good. <laughs> nope. You're never good with me around. So I'll tell you this. We've covered racism. We've covered fascism. We've covered Marxism. But now it's time for the schism of the podcast, which is, what genre is this? Who wants to go first? My esteemed gentleman. Uh, so as uh, Maynard James Keenan once said from the Stalin schism, I know the pieces fit, but uh, they don't fit too well for me for this one. This reads as like, oddly enough, a student film mixed with some sort of strange art house softcore adult film mixed with a strange almost dark fantasy but i'm gonna be real with you chief i don't think this is a horror movie man oh I yeah you gonna pull that one on me a, i do not think okay. this is a horror movie all right fair play fair play dan why don't you intercede here I'll intercede. I think I agree partially with what Nico said. I do a hundred percent think it's a art house, almost soft core horror movie. I do think it's horror again to my earlier comment about visuals and, and the sound, like a, it sounds like a seventies Italian joint and a lot of seventies Italian movies also kind of loop into this sort of like art housey, Lots of naked people, lots of like open sexuality kind of stuff. And I feel like it it's right up there with them. I'll say this. I actually don't believe this is a horror movie. Shock and awe. And I think that this entire movie, and this is going to sound like a crazy aside, but I promise you it's not. This entire was... movie is just a crazy aside, so that fits. <laughs> There was this story I was reading, and the author really wanted to write like an action kind of fantasy story, but they wouldn't let him. So he started off with like a romance novel. And then at the end of it, he started writing the novel he actually wanted, which was this like action story at the end of it. And I feel like this movie is similar to that in a way because I feel like the true story to be told here is the political tale. I almost feel like. And Valentina's role in that and navigating that. And I feel like the horror element to me is so sparse that it's kind of forgettable, to be honest. Baba Yaga to me works much better as a metaphor than she does a monster. And this is the weird part. They even tell Valentina, right? And I th that's why I feel like I feel like part of this is the like seduction of authoritarianism because they tell her she doesn't have a choice put her through some like real kinky kind of whipping torture. And then they let her go and let her put her clothes back on because when Arno's there, she's like normal and fine and not bleeding. So I was like, 
What's really going on here? And I will also say I am so progressive that I didn't even see the titties in this movie. I'll have to go back Shut and rewatch. The fuck up. Oh my god. Now, all that being said, it's time for the what would you do? And oh boy, did I have a thought on this one because what the fuck was I about to say to this? <laughs> so, here's what it is. The three of us are artists. Shock and all, we really are. But the three of us are artists and we're at a party with some real high thinking, highfalutin liberals as it was. Now, you and I are having an esteemed conversation, Nico, and so is Dan, when we realize that we're just surrounded by liberals. And so we turn around, these liberal cooks, and we go. <laughs> like, we got to go home at this point. And you knew that was coming. You absolutely had to know that was coming. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely did. Yeah. So, you know, we kind of break off on our own separate ways here. And for each of us, we're the person, the main character. What would you do if, like, you tried to stop an animal from getting run over and then Bobby Yaga pops out the whip and is like, yo, we're destined to meet? What's your initial reaction? I would stay home. Because she, she was like, <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. And I'd be like, all right, I'm staying in bed. All fucking day. <laughs> see, see me, bitch. Damn. Dan would make sure this becomes a porno. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Words. I didn't even mean it like that. I just meant like I ain't leaving my oh, house. Oh, Jesus bro! Christ. What did you think he meant? What did you think the man meant? He was gonna stay in bed, and she was gonna meet him there in bed. Well, I mean, okay. That's I guess a secondary opinion that is valid as well, but that wasn't my intention. <laughs> All right, Nico, what's good with you though? Man, I, I mean, I wouldn't get into her car first off. I would be like. I mean, like, okay, yes, it's the 70s, but if there is someone who looks like she could give me a major quest line in a Persona game who is going to come up to me and offer me a ride in her definitely not haunted getup, I, I, I think I have enough self-awareness to realize that's probably a bad idea and just say I'll get a ride with someone else. I'll say this. You know how people check and it's like, oh, it's the witching hour? Well, I'll tell Doesn't you what. Doesn't she look like she should be in the fucking velvet room, though? For real? Yeah. But yeah. I'll say this. You got to check for the witching hour, but you also got to check for the milfing hour. And that's when she showed up, bro. And I was like, yeah, nah, that's two times you can't, you can't be, you know, talking with nobody, bro. The witching hour and the milfing hour. Know it well. Know Again, both of them well. to my previous point of dance situation. <laughs> Now, let's say we did take the bait and, you know, we go to her house and she passes you that doll. You taking that doll back to your crib? Fuck, Fuck no. no. Yeah, that's the DOTD stamp right there. Absolutely fucking not. Now, past that again, let's say we know now that, you know, she put some kind of hex on us. And let's just say we're photographers for the sake of it. Though we could have like a cursed mic or something. I don't know. Dan's got the cursed interface, whoever records on it. But anyways... So you had the fucking cursed controller that you had to. It did. It did oh shit! Don't controller. bring that up. We don't talk about that controller. <laughs> oh shit! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. More on no, that. I didn't break the seal on a future bonus episode. No, you did not. On a past bonus episode because we. Oh, uh, true. We did about talk it. about it. We did. We did. We did. And last but not least, let's say you know, with all the information, would you go to Baba Yaga's house to confront her, or what would you do once you know the full story? Probably file a restraining order. Oh, keep him moving. Mm. Yeah, that's a good idea. I would stay away because Bobby Yaga was like, hey, come and get your camera. And I would have been like, no, you curse that camera. That camera kills people. I don't want that camera back. <laughs> Why would I come get it? So I would just not go. Just get a new fucking camera. Try harder, Bobby Yaga. <laughs> Yo, when she took the piece from her garter belt, I was like, yo, she's going to fucking do some voodoo shit on her. And she didn't. Are you kidding me? Yeah. But now, it's time for the what would you do? And I am going to say right up no, front. It's, no, it's not. Well, so it's time for the critic review. And I'm going to say right up front, this movie is on Rotten Tomatoes, just under a different name. On Rotten Tomatoes, it's called Kiss Me, Kill Me. But it doesn't have a critic review, only an audience rating. So we're going to go to the good lads at imdb what does this movie have on imdb do you think out of 100 
I just want to intercede here real fucking quick, folks, because earlier before the podcast, Justin did, in fact, t- prompt me, hey, Nico, go look up the Rotten Tomatoes for Kiss Me, Kill Me. And I was about to say, like, you literally just told me the rating, so don't give me any bullshit on this. But on IMDb, so that was that was a nice save on your part, Justin. That was a nice save. I'm going to guess this has a 5.9. Well, give me a square out of 100. 59. How about you, Dan? I'm going to say a 71. Well, Nico cheats and wins again because this movie has a 5.7 out of 10 or a 57. So well done, you scrub. I also want to point out that Bobby Yaga, like uh, this parts of the movie autoplay when you go onto IMDb with like the parts with the titty too. So if you're under 18, don't, don't look at this on IMDb. So especially not at work. Eh. Apparently there's a re-edited, reworked final cut that's about to come out. That's what I'm seeing the trailer for. The Shameless 35th anniversary edition. Holy shit, we're getting in line. It's from shamelessfilms.com. What the fuck? Hey yo. Are you and then it like says, No, and then after it says the video is not intended for all audiences, enter your birthday to view the to view the video. Bro, you already autoplayed it for me. Whoa, sorry. This is like a stream of consciousness thing that just happened here, but <laughs> more, more, more on this later. I'll do the Wait, investigation. No, into, we're into getting shameless a films. porn remake? More on that later. So you guys are wrong, obviously, with that. But it's Side time to quest figure out. unlocked, question mark? Oh, yeah. Well, what would you give the movie, Dan? Oh, yeah, brother. I think I would give this one... I'm going to say a 68. I enjoyed 68. it. Yeah, 68. I enjoyed it. I thought it was pretty good. I liked the visuals. I liked the audio. The the Nazi dreams and the political aside, some of the political asides I enjoyed, some of them just didn't quite, it felt like there was a piece missing. And i not even saying that like post looking up the fact that there's edited you know cut scenes just like even during watching it i was like this feels weird i'm 68 for me i thought it was enjoyable nico where do you sit with this so i genuinely am stunned that i forgot to mention this and that none of us did earlier but one of the things that impacted the movie's experience for me and i'm sure y'all as well is that the audio was a solid like half second lagging behind the entire movie and there was a lot of conversation where sometimes mouths were closed but words were still coming through and it just felt kind of sloppy isn't the right word but just weird and that's my vibe on the film as a whole it's just really weird and i in this very moment like i i'm still sort of trying to come to terms with how i i feel about it it is a movie that is very in intellectual by its nature with all it talks about and the imagery but it is so incredibly obtuse in so many ways that i i just it misses the mark for me i'm gonna give this a 59 i did have fun though i will say that so i'm gonna give this one an interesting rating and i'll say this with many curtails and amendments i like a lot of this movie i dig a lot of this movie i think a lot of this movie is really good racism it's kind of like one of those things where I don't really enjoy racism a lot. And oh, yeah. I don't, well, it's cause it's like one of those things where it's like, sometimes you don't you have just to get, explain that. You really That's, don't. It's okay. Well, I'm saying like for me in particular, like when I watch movies like this and stuff like that, I feel like I got to explain a little bit why I was like, you know, I was like ready for it. And why I was like, whatever else, because for me personally, I feel like I just have to like numb myself out to it because like it's already enough on like a fucking day-to-day basis that i'm like bruh like i'm not even gonna like get offended at this movie that i chose to watch at this point like fuck it man like i'm gonna see it contextualize it 
know what it is and like keep it rocking but that doesn't change the fact that like it does put a sour taste in my mouth when there's a movie that otherwise like i really want to heartily recommend but it's like you know like what am i gonna do fucking like endorse to my friends like oh like be like your ancestors around the campfire like the fuck so that's what i'm saying like it's kind of one of those things where it's like i don't know like it's not something that i want to influence my score but it does anyways so personally i'm giving this one a 65 i like the movie but i i don't know like maybe i don't know in the year 3000 when we've eliminated racism brother i don't know like maybe it'll be better at that point but not right now for me so that's where i'm at but does this movie get a recommendation I don't think so. I, I'm struggling to th- think who I would like. I'm struggling to think of who this movie is for. Well, it's a pass for me as well, Dan and Nico. Who this is for? I think this is for people who want a weird political discussion without a satisfying resolution. I mean, shit, man. Sure. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I think this movie is just an excuse for titty. Honestly. Sometimes it's all you need. But if you've got some viewpoints on this movie, hit us up. We're on Twitter and Instagram at DOTD Horror. We're also on Facebook, which is, of course, Don't Open That Door. Plus, you can check out everything we've done on our website, which is DOTDHorror.com. But till then, be aware of stranger danger. Take care of one another. And as always, dear listener, don't open that door. Bye. A reading from Justin. Oh. When the beautiful Valentina spurns the advances of the enigmatic witch, a curse is put on her camera, and all those who pose for her are damned. Pursued by the sensuous seduction of Baba Yaga, at every turn, she must either submit to her S&M desires or confront the repressed lesbian feelings buried deep within. Carnal lust explodes as she must choose between external decadence and staid reality, with her very soul at stake as witchcraft casts its spell. Combining the haunting atmosphere of Polanski ooh, with the sexual styling of Argento on crystal meth, Baba Yaga is 70s Euro sleaze at its very best, showcasing stunning cinematography and is a must for everyone let down by the distinctly prudish Barbarella when it comes to erotic Euro comics. This was written on shamelessfilms.com. For the shameless fan edition of Baba Yaga, the final cut.